Needless to say, I'm very humbled at the response we've had to our little breed. And uh, it seems to, uh, it started back in, uh, with a handful of people who uh, have been very instrumental in uh, our whole program. Good people that, that uh, had, uh, had the best interest of the future in mind. The board members that started uh, the South Pole Breed with me years ago, the Vosses and uh, the Summers, all these people that, uh, uh, Shanks, all these people that have been, all the board members that are here, if you would stand up and let everybody give you a round of applause, please. We, we, couldn't, we couldn't do it without you. Um, got uh, several things I want to, I'm not very much of a good speaker, so you have to bear with me. I entered, uh, I had a teacher that talked me into entering the, in 4-H club, entering the speaking contest back in, when I was in the, I think I was in the seventh grade. And so I said, well, I'll give it a try. I entered that year and there was three people entered and I, I placed third. <laughs> My teacher said, well, so maybe maybe do it again next year. I said, maybe you get better. I did. There were two people in there. I finished second. <laughs> so, so I'm not much of a speaker, but I'm on, I speak from my heart. And uh, anyway, uh, we're here today to learn and teach. I learn at these events. Uh, I for sure don't know it all. I learn something every one of these events I go to because I try to have an honest heart. I try to do everything not make my mind up 100% on anything, but be a little bit open-minded and say, well, let me listen to this guy. He may have, he may have found something that I need. But this, my, my dream for South Pole started back in the mid-80s. In 1980, I knew nothing about a cow. I didn't know one end of a cow from another. Um, I, I wasn't raised around cattle. I had my grandfather raise me. I had a little, a little small cotton farm. Anyway, uh, the uh, started with Hereford cows, and we had a lot of fescue grass on the farm, the old cotton farm. That the ground was totally wore out at the time. You couldn't have found a, a dung beetle or earthworm within a mile of my farm, I guess, back in in 1980 when I took it over from my grandpa. They would sprayed it with everything that you could spray it with to kill bugs, and they killed all the all the bugs. So. Anyway, it's taken us, we've done organic practices now for haven't used any commercial fertilizer, sprays, pesticides for 35 years. And we have a tremendous population of dung beetles and earthworms now. And our soil is very healthy, our grass is healthy, and our cattle are healthy. But in the 1980, I got a few herd from cows and I take them home and they did they fur ball up on me, the calves would fur ball up on that fescue grass and they were big old things and and I had 14, 15, 100 pound cows. I turned out there and they'd just go to pieces. I said, well, this ain't working. I had no sense to realize that. So I started studying and I, in the back of that tour bus going down the road every day for hours. I would put out my beef books in the back lounge and every uh, college professor I could get to send me information on studies they were doing on cattle. And if we got to a city and I could find an old, old cattleman there that had been do it and for years I'd try to go out if it was in 50 miles I'd rent me a car and I'd drive out and try to spend the day with somebody and learn something. The Frank Feldmans of the world uh, of Burroughs out in New Mexico I mean these people that I got uh, got to hang around and got to learn from Bob Crane down in Florida uh, but as the uh, after about three or four years of studying my lesson and uh, I said well I told my wife one night I said I think we in the south we don't have a the tools in our two box to be competitive in a, in a quality beef program. All the information I could look at said that Brahma had been used to cross on Hereford to make Brayford or Brangus on Angus. But every time Brahma came in, I'm not here to bash the Brahma. They've done a tremendous job over the years at what they do. But if we get into a quality meat program and we're trying to produce it off the grass, then the Brahmas didn't fit into the picture. Every time you looked at studies, every time you looked at shear force test, the meat got tougher as the more Brahma that was involved in it. So I said, well, don't know why when I said, I want to try to build a breed 
that's tender off of grass that will compete with English cattle because someday there's a big hole in the meat industry now. One out of every three steaks that goes through our industry is out of the South. And it's probably got Brahma influence. And it, you've got connective tissue and gristle and dental floss in it that shouldn't be there. It's not comfortable for people to, to go out and pay 20 bucks for a steak or 30 bucks for a steak and, and have, a, have a bad steak. So anyway, uh, after uh, studying a bunch of breeds, I wanted to use Hereford and Angus as my base. And I wanted a red animal, so I used red Angus and Hereford to start with. And then I discovered a breed called the Centipole from Virgin Islands. And the Centipole were the most heat tolerant animal that I'd run into. They were even probably more heat tolerant than the Brahma cattle, or at least as heat tolerant according to the University of Florida, who measured, took the cattle and put them out in the heat, sunshine, and measured their exterior temperature and their interior temperature every hour. And, um, the centipole were some of the most heat tolerant animals. Anyway, so we the, the weakest link I had in my chain was Red Angus. Red Angus were the hairiest. They like they hated fescue. I'd bring some of them in. They would fur ball up, and I'd lose about half of them in two years. So I had to get the hair off the Red Angus. So centipole was the perfect choice. Centipole. A lot of the centipole breeds. Some of the centipole breeds were homozygous for the centipole for the slick hair gene. So the in one generation. The center pole matched to the red angus, you'd have a slick haired calf. So then I discovered a breed, Frank Felton in Missouri turned me on to a breed called the Barzonas. Barzonas were a composite breed put together by the Bard family out in Arizona. Uh, and if you've ever been around Phoenix, Arizona, you look out there and it's nothing but cactus and stuff, you say, well, cow can't, couldn't, couldn't make a living out here. Well, their Hereford and Angus, they had the same problem with their Hereford and Angus I had with mine that they weren't adapted to that environment. So they, they got some Afghander, non-Brahman Afghander bulls from the King Ranch one year and used them. And a couple of years later, they used a couple of Santa Catrudas bulls from the King Ranch. And that's what made the Barzana breed. The Barzana are known as the hardy breed. They are indeed very hardy cattle. Never have one in the sick, sick pens. Never see one calf. They have small calves, good udders. If they didn't have good udders, the, the, the others would get drug off out there in those cacti in, in uh, Arizona. So I give a lot of credit to the Barzonas for, there was a lot of magic when the South Pole came together. I wanted to get the good udders and the small calves from the Barzona. I wanted to get the hardiness from the Barzona. The cattle that were very hardy and didn't have to be uh, tended to. If you're a commercial guy and you're trying to make a living off of cattle, you haven't got time for problems. You need problem-free cattle. Um, and so anyway, the, after putting the four-way cross together over several years, I had two to three hundred head of each breed at one time. From the cows that, that really contributed to the South Pole were two or three or no more than four cows from each breed. Two or three or four percent of each breed was all that wound up being good enough to come into the South Pole because we wanted all the, we wanted everything that we could get in that in that package. But to start with, what did we have? We had nothing but a hybrid. We had a four-way cross that was a hybrid. They were 14, 1,500 pound cows. Way too, way too big to, to get the job done. So we started selecting for those animals that were best for our environment, the shorter ones that were thicker. And it's taken us years and years to get to the point where we now have two and three frame cattle that will weigh from 850 to around 1150, depending on where you're at, what part of the country you're in. The further you go south, of course, the less quality is in the grass. So you get down in Bermuda grass and Bahia grass, that cow's got to be shaped a little bit different than on my farm, where I've got probably a dozen varieties of grasses. The cows can, I'd support 1,100 11, 11 pound cow easily because I have the quality and nutrition to do it. But you get down to Florida on Bahia grass or Bermuda grass, and about all you can, uh, if you the cow, if you don't supplement them any, they got to have a big old barrel, big belly. It's the number one thing that they got to have in order to consume enough grass to make a living off of it. That same cow out west in Arizona, which I'm at the Barzonas, they didn't have to have a whole lot of guts because they could eat two cowboy hats full of grass today and, and get the nutrition that they were, that a cow in Florida will have to eat a half a pickup load of grass to get the same nutrition out of it. So 
with the South Pole, it's not for everybody. We're not trying to be for everybody. I've got, I've been over the past week, I, I made the mistake of getting online <laughs> and reading some, some of the things that people were saying about me. From I'm goofy, for one thing. I'm backward, I'm, I'm old fashioned because I, I, we haven't, and when we started putting the South Pole together, I'd been through a lot of other purebred breeds. I'd, I'd been through Hereford and Angus and, and about, you name it, I've probably tried it on my farm at one time. From unloading a load, a load of limousine cattle and watching them run through four fences before I got them stock. <laughs> that was years and years ago, but anyway. Uh, you know, y'all, you make mistakes and you learn as you go, but uh, you know, I, I figured out real quick, I said, i got to have a gentle animal. Because all the data that, that I was reading about from two different university colleges, for sure, that said that you couldn't have tenderness without having gentleness. A gentle animal will give you a tender piece of meat. A wild animal will give you a tough piece of meat. And this has been proven at two different college tests you look at and see, but they set up electric eye on these steers in front of 15 or 20 feet in front of the work chute. And when they'd open the work chute, they would measure the time it took for that animal to exit. Those that hauled ass out of there, you know, they were always tough. <laughs> and the ones that took their time and kind of walked out and said, how y'all doing? They were tender. And it went right on down through, uh, it was consistent. But uh, we went to South Pole last week and we can't put up with any wild South Poles. One of my friends the other day, he said, Teddy said, I had a heifer, said, one for, for no reason at all, said, she's all of a sudden she became kind of wild, said, every time we were going to pen, she'd throw her head up and said, then she got where she was coming. He said, I, I had to ship her. I said, well, that's the best, best thing to do. Because we, we don't need any wild animal. One wild animal will make a bunch of the rest of them wild if you leave her in there long enough. So let's get, if we got South Pole, we're going to lose one every once in a while. We're not 100% perfect yet. But we have breeders now, then the South Pole breeder, that not on two or three cows, but on several hundred cows, are getting 95% plus breed up on their cow herd every year. Because they got the grass to do it with, they got the genetics to do it with, they got the knowledge to do it with. Our young kids these days in town, we never before have we had the tools in order for you to make money with cows. Because we got the, we got the system, thanks to Greg Judy and there's people who have paved the way for learning mob grazing and rotational grazing and taking advantage of your grass, most efficient use of your grass. We now have the tools on the cow part to, to match that system so that you can make money. Fertility and longevity are 10 times more important than any, when we get hung up on a carcass trait, when we get hung up on this and that and the other. But at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is how long that cow lives on your farm and how many cash she produces and how much grocery she eats to give you that poundage of grass. So we're more interested in profit per acre than we are any individual animal. But it boils down to that individual animal has got to be good. And my, I always started about all my education talking about beef cattle with one thing, udder. Udder, udder, udder. Even though most people associate good udders with dairy cows, never think of that again. Beef cows have got to have a good udder. They have small teeth and a good udder, and, and you walk that line. I want a cow that milks well enough a cow that milks well enough to raise a good calf, get the calf started on its way to life. But you don't want too much milk. Milk is not an efficient way to raise a calf. Too much milk, if, if it was, we'd all be running jerseys. But, but it's not, uh, so you don't want a cow that milks so heavy that she's gonna blow that udder out at six or seven or eight years old. So a cow that gets started, got small teats, gets the calf going, and then takes care of her after, after that calf's four or five months old, this cow starts cutting back on her milk, and she starts gaining weight off the good grass going into winter. Easy fattening, easy fleshing. Um, Y'all have, have to keep me posted. I, I, my wife tells me I have a tendency to run in my mouth too much. <laughs> but I, it's all from trying to, trying to find the truth about these cows. Um, I'll was, I was talk about flushing a little bit here. We, uh, I got two or three subjects you want to talk about. Flushing, why do we not want to flush cows in the South Pole breed? 
This is a question I've had raised on online for the last couple of weeks several times. Okay, I went through, fl I flushed cows in the, in the 90s, the late 80s and early 90s, I flushed cows. We did a lot of that research on our farm. Um, the ultrasound that, that predicts uh, tenderness, we developed a lot of that information right on our farm and our cattle. I've done as much research on that on cattle as probably anybody in the South. But uh, the, the South Pole, when we get down to the point of, of uh, making a breed, Flushing cows, I flush cows, and I never made a penny, I don't think, flushing cows. I never improved the breed that I was flushing the cows to, because of several reasons. First of all, we, it's, uh, if the only cows that should ever be considered being flushed would be a 15-year-old a cow that would give you 13 calves, for instance. She never missed. She gave it to your old. She never missed. She's 15 years old. She's still got a good udder that you don't have to milk out. When the cat she caves, it's still cat can still nurse her. All this information, if the, if the cow uh, is uh, the um, if, but but that's not what people will pick out. If you give them the freedom to start flushing cows, they're gonna go back and say, well, man, that's the best four-year-old I've ever seen. I'm gonna flush her. And then what happens? As soon as you put the needle in there and give her drugs, that cow is never the same. You change her forever from what she will be. And then there's a problem of, em of before, you, before you go with the embryos. Well, you either put them in an inferior beef cow or you put them into a, a dairy cow, probably. Either way is not good. It's no reflection of what the breed, the mother and daddy, of genetically of that animal had to pass along. Also, I believe that the recipient cow, the cow that carries the calf, passes on some of her traits. I can't prove this, but I think it will be in years to come. She passes on some of her traits to this calf that's in her. Gardner Angus proved that. Gardner Angus proved that. Steve, the boss, told Steve the question that specific cow is in Okay, well, I, 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 I suspect that for a long time, but there will be proof coming, I think, in the years to come that that, that happens. Okay, so either one or two things happen. If you put it, in, if you put embryo into an inferior recipe rec rec cow. What happens? She has an inferior cat, fur ball, you know, two or three hundred pound wing off was a cow's ball. How, well, genetically, what was the calf? I have no idea what the calf would have done if it was on his mama. Okay, well, are you put into a beef, are you put into a dairy cow? Okay, well, oh wow, we put into a dairy cow. What happens? We get the calf fat, so fat that it will never perform. A heifer, you deposit udder fat in the udder, it will never milk like it should, you deposit fat in the scrotum of a bull, he will never perform like he should perform. Look at Argentina or some of the places where they do total grass dairies, or to total grass, and you'll see the quality on the semen, the volume on the semen, all that goes with it, no doubt. But embryo calves, I wound up having, you're going to wind up having around a couple thousand dollars at the best you can do in an embryo calf. Probably a little more than that now. This is back when I was doing it. Was called, I, I was winding up with around two hundred, two thousand dollars in embryo calf. Time it hits the ground and time it gets weaning. The problem is you're running a whole herd of, you got to run a separate herd of recip cows, or somebody does. And if those if those cows are not in the likeness of what you're trying to do, then I think you, you really uh, the, the records keeping system is really messed up at that point. Because you don't know what you got 10 or 12 calves here that you've got two thousand dollars piece in so you got twenty five thousand dollars in this flush and then what you've got you don't know what you've got it's like going to, to and, and people buying bulls next year i apologize a lot of this the covid this year the past couple of years has kept me from doing as president of the association what i need to do and i apologize my fault Next year, we will have more data in the catalog on the mamas of the bulls that we're selling. How many calves have they had? How, uh, and, and what age are they? Well, how have they, how, how, how they done? We've got to have this information because it all boils down. You can't go out here and look at the good bull and say, man, he looks good to me. Our breed has got to be built on data, folks. It's got to be built on data. And data, unspewed data, if we will all turn in our information on our whole herd, and within a matter of a few years, the ice cream floats to the top. 
It's very easy. I can go, you look at my records, I look at your records, and we can pick out the best cow in the herd, the most profitable cow in the herd. How do we do that? Fertility longevity. I've, I'll say for years, we're trying to build a maternal index for the South Pole instead of EPDs because of fertility and longevity is the two traits that matter most and are the most money-making traits for the commercial cow calf producer. Always have, always will be. 10,000 more important than any, any carcass trait. Quit trying to make your cows be a Swiss Army knife to be everything. You can't be the most perfect carcass in the animal. It, it, you know, even though South Pole will carcass, our, our, our carcass uh, will run with English cattle, I feel very confident. And we won, we actually won the taste panel test down in Florida, the University of Florida, if you want to check out that out, uh, above several of the different breeds, including Wagyu crosses were in there, Devon crosses were in there, Angus were in there. And their 28 panels that they had trained to judge meat at, uh, in a blind taste test after three days, after three days South Pole was picked number one. But we don't promote that. That's not what we're here about. We're not, we just want to be in the running for carcass. We just want to be acceptable in the mix with Hereford and Angus, English cattle. But what we want to do best is be the cow-calf king of the South. With that small cow that's efficient, that can that can give you, I use the example, and don't change, you, 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 you take two 1,500 pound cows and give me three 1,000 pound cows, and we're both supporting about 3,000 pound of body weight, We'll say your cow, we'll give her the credit, we'll say she's a good cow, a big cow, 1,500 pound cow, she weans off 600 pounds of calf, and my little 1,000 pound cow weans off 500 pounds of calf. How, 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 who's, who's gonna make the most money at the end of the year? My little cows will. I challenge each one of you, if you don't believe in the little cow philosophy, go back and look at your own cows. I will say that the most fertile cows in your herd, the, calf, the most fertile cows in your herd, the calf in the first 21 days are probably the smallest cows in your herd. On average, on, uh, yeah, it's, that's a brutal thing. The biggest cows in your herd, the biggest cows in your herd, will I think it, over a period of time, unless supplemented, will slowly fall to the wayside. As far as they will be the first cows to to maybe miss. Uh, that, that first cycle they're calving in the, in the second cycle then. Or maybe in the next year they calve, they fall out of bed, they fall in the third cycle, third or on, on our farm, I try to, we try to use cattle that are born in the first 45 days, even though I leave bulls out longer, because I'd rather have a late calf than have no calf. And if I want to sell that calf, a cow, ship them later, uh, they bring more with a cow-calf pair anyway. So, but anyway, uh, I leave bulls out about 90 to 100 days. And then, but, it, but anything that I use for seed stock to keep to re use to go back into the breeding program, I, I put fertility pressure on it. It's got to be born in the first 30 to 45 days, preferably. But we want to be the number one breed at doing what we do best: is harvesting grass in an efficient way and doing it for a long period of time. And a cow that can go through the winter without having to supplement them. So we need easy fleshing, easy fattening cattle. The next thing that we have to do is, is have wine bred cattle. If, if folks don't know much about wine bred cattle, um, it's like seed corn. How many people in here are familiar with seed corn or planted corn before? Okay, it says on the bag of hybrid seed corn, so don't keep the seed from this and try to replant it next year. Why does it do that? Because it's a hybrid. It cannot reproduce itself. The first four-way crosses we had on South Pole were nothing but we go hybrids. They could not, it was impossible for them to reproduce themselves. So before you go out here today and find an animal that looks great, look, you better find out if he's got, if he's got any line bred in him at all. Is he a first generation? If he is, he's not gonna breed what he looks. Educate yourself, folks. There's, there's cows out here today, there's, there's a couple cows out here today that I would not take home. I did not do. I did not get out and look at all the cows this year. And okay, every cow that went into the sale, we left it to the discretion of the, of the, the, the people that consigned cattle. And it's not 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 a bad thing. I'm just saying, there's a cow out there that I saw that had calved. Before she calved, you couldn't tell she her udder was, was was too big. Her teeth were too big. After she calved, 
she's not a cow that needs to represent our breed. But anyway, we've like I said, we've made any mistakes. Anything you see here today, I'll, I'll accept the responsibility for it. But use your own discretion, use your own judgment. And don't get caught up in the fact that just because it's the South Pole, that it's worth a lot of damn money. Don't do that because, thank you, give me a round of applause. Come on. But, but, you know, a cow is, you know, if, if a cow's going to be worth $4,000, uh, a bred heifer, she better stay in your herd till she's 15 and give you 13 calves if you're ever going to make a dollar on her. Because it's going to take you four or five years to even break even, maybe six years to break even, I'm sure, according to what your expenses are, it's going to uh, differ from farm to farm. But I got a little thing here I wanted to read that, uh, talking about, uh, but line breeding is a necessity. If you don't have the concentration of genetics in an animal to control that mating, then you have a random mating. But if you have as much as 40 or 50 percent of one animal's, say you back back three generations, you got four generations, you got 16 grandmas back here in, in an animal's pedigree. If, if half of those grandmas are the same, then you have 50 percent of that grandma's genetics in this calf. And this, and he will produce the odds are he's going to produce, his genetics are concentrated, so he has less variations of what the calf is going to be. Dr. Jan Bonnemar, who I think was one of the, probably one of the best uh, cattlemen that ever walked the face of the earth, he could tell more about looking at the cow that he knew nothing about than most people could that owned the cow. And this is from Dr. Bonnemar's, Dr. Bonnemar's son was talking about Dr. Bonsmore, he said, my father often stressed the point of mas being a master of observation. The point has been driven home to me many times as a, as a professional hunting guide. The more observation and attention to detail, the more success is accomplished. The understanding of observation can be a powerful tool. My simple understanding and appreciation for Dr. Bonsmore was his ability to just observe nature and what God created, his ability His ability to just observe nature and what God created. His ability to follow and observe this path on its natural flow. His teachings are to help us understand the way nature wants to work. To understand is to observe the nature flow and to swim with, and, and to swim with it. The battle of fighting this nature flow will never be won. If you got black cows and they're standing out in the pond with their tongue hanging out in July, you will never win the fight with black cows. They're, you're fighting Mother Nature. It's not, it's not that. They, they can't work. And it's all on a percentage. When I talk about people having 95% breed up on, this is on first calf heifers, second calf heifers, cows in 45 days. 96% breed up on several hundred cows this year. So this shows what can be done with these cattle. But to understand and observe, uh, he, uh, Dr. Bosmar was also, he was able to see how nature selects animals to thrive in their environment and why. The hormonal balance that creates animals to succeed and the physical attributes that follow this balance. Simple to understand, it is to observe creation. Simple to understand is to observe creation. Observing an abundance of production and longevity is to see animals that are environmentally fit. These animals that need to be these animals need to be valued and reproduced. My father also believed heavily in line breeding these successful animals so that they could more consistently reproduce themselves. And I'll talk about one other subject here. Uh, uh, we've had discussion on purebred and full-blood cattle. Uh, in the South Pole, we allow the cheapest way for young folks to get into the South Pole business right now. If you've got some good commercial cows, start breeding them to a South Pole bull. In just a few years, if you use lime bred South Pole bulls, in just a few years, you can have, like Miss Judy and her husband, they started with Beefmaster back years ago. And uh, how many years have you been using South Pole? 
14, 15 years now, I've been using South Pole. And so most of your cattle now are either three quarters and seven eighths. But most of them are three quarters and seven eighths South Pole now. And when you get to that point, then, but they started with a good base of, of, of cattle that were uh, beef, ma beef master cattle. Beef master, nothing wrong with them. They were crossed up with other breeds. They were crossed with other breeds, too. But we had rules before. They were, they were a functioning herd with the same system. Yeah, the same system. Yeah. You you carried it to and and South culled Pole. anything that didn't didn't right. breed and right. yeah. same South thing. Pole just fixed all that. South Pole fixed all that. Well, you know we're we're not. I'm gonna go back to purebred and full blood. But anyway, the the good cows that she that Miss Judy had, the the good beef masters, and there were some good beef master cows there. I saw them. The good ones are going to contribute to the South Pole now. If there's if there's an eighth or a sixteenth or what it is in there, it goes back to a good 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 genetics. So we know it's not going to hurt. Those those cattle are only going to help what we're going to do. So we have so you can breed up. I have about three Hereford cows left, uh, four Hereford her, her, her cows left on my farm that are really really good cows. Got beautiful udders, small teats, and I'm going to use I'm breeding up from them in order to keep. The Hereford influence. Hereford's very important. It's quarter in the mix, and Hereford's one of the most overlooked breeds on the cross. They're easy fattening. They're easy keeping. Um, they're, uh, you know, they, they just do well for us. Uh, but anyway, uh, we need good purebred cattle coming on, so don't hesitate to buy a good purebred bull from somebody. It ain't gonna be a full blood. The purebreds will be better, should be better than our full bloods going forward because you have a little bit of extra something in their kit. I have a Bonsmar cow that I went through uh, probably 200 cows to find a Bonsmar cow that was small enough and short enough and fit in with my South Poles. And she's calved every year in my probe and I got a, I got a heifer out of her that I'm gonna bring into the probe and start and uh, breed back back to her so I'll have a little shit touch of Bonsmar in some of them. I got a centipole cow. That's, that, but the centipole is the rarest breed to have perfect odors for a long period of time because they're almost a dual purpose breed, the centipole were. It's very easy to get centipole cows that milk too much and boy at that other time they're six or seven or eight years old. But the ones, uh, I had three or four cows in the centipole breed that went till they were 20 years old and still had good udders. So that's the cows that we've tried to incorporate back in the South Pole. But we need these good purebred cattle coming on. Don't get hung up on pain, everybody's gotta be full of blood. Purebred is 87% uh, and up on females and 92.5% 92 on bulls, right? Uh, I guess that's right in my uh, 15, 16, say what that is on bulls. Anyway, so let's, let's, let's go out and breed breed your good cows, get you a good South Pole bull. AI, the South, AI semen is the cheapest on South Pole than any other breed out there you can find, I guess. If you're a member, I sell typically sell $10 a straw to other South Pole members. So if you can't afford a $10 straw semen, then maybe you need to uh, get your Ang Angus bull. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. There's some good Angus cattle out there. I don't mean to, uh, but in in their environment, they're they're great. You know, they do good, uh, like Herford. But in outside of their environment, we have to be honest. I, I try not to get blind. blind. I try not to have to go out there and look at my cows and say, well, this cow is my cow. All my all my cows aren't good. I, I, every every week I look to cull one. Every month I look to cull one. It ain't doing the job. Well, as long as we have cattle, you're gonna have one fall out of the bed every once in a while. But what we're talking about is the percentages. If, if you have a hundred head of South Pole, I'll, I'll put them up against a hundred head of South Pole heifers, and you can get any other breed that you want to get, and we'll run against them, and after 10 years, I'll lay my money on the South Pole. There'll be more of them around, they've made you more money at the end of that time because they are adapted to their environment. That's the first thing they have to do, be adapted to their environment. The second thing is udder. I go back to udder again. Beef cows gotta have a great udder. If they ain't got small teats and a, a nice uniform odor that's going to last longer than the cow, you don't need the cow. If she goes out six or seven years old because she's got a big old long teat and the calf can't get around it and you're out there trying to milk it out, you ain't got time for that. You get half a dozen of them, you spent your whole day out there trying to milk out darn cows. Let's get rid of the problems. Just because they're South Pole, if they're not a good South Pole, get rid of them. I've culled over years, I've, I've culled many, many cows, but the ones I've got left, every time I cull, the ones I've got left get better. It'll happen, the same thing will happen on your farm. Okay, I, I think I've covered everything uh, that I need to cover. I'll take some questions now. If we've got any questions, I'll open it up and take some questions. Breeding up, lining up like you just talked about. Is there any concern over the long term for the 
um, delusion of the foundational breed. No, because the foundation breed is a four-way cross. Well, I know it's a cross, but... Uh, yep, it, you know, the integrity of the breed is what it does. Fertility, longevity. Give me those... Give me those bulls that are breed that they're 10 or 12 years old and they're still sound. Give me those cows that give you a calf every year and never miss in that front of the calf, that first month of calving every year. If we'll keep our records, those cows are the ones that's going to be worth the money going forward, folks. You stack them in a pedigree. You got cows that are, have had uh, never missed and they're 10 or 12 or 14 years old. Stack those cows in a pedigree. Don't worry about looking at the bulls and trying to pick the best bull out there. Your eye will deceive you. Trust your records. If you keep good records, then you'll have good cattle. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Uh, we have a, a mixed group. We started using uh, South Pole bulls, and this is not about South Pole bulls. We raise our own replacement heifer candidates uh, in Northeast Texas and uh, allow them to naturally wean over winter with their pregnant dom mothers. And, we, and I use the Dom's ability then to breed back uh, after she calves and what the long yearling weight might be on a replacement heifer. The question I have though is, there seems to be a couple of avenues to get to that replacement heifer candidate. One of which is rough them through. That sounded like what it was you were describing. I'm not against it, don't misunderstand. No, I'm not against roughing through. First calf, I take care of, I, uh, a heifer needs to be about 60% of her mature weight when the bulls go out with her. If it costs you a couple hundred dollars and getting some some good hay in order to keep those heifers gaining a pound, pound and a quarter a day, you have to do that. If you if you make them rough it, uh, then that, that heifer, you can't, you may have to wait and, and calve as a three year old. But to me it's worth, the South Pole or physically the, the ideal South Pole to me is, is physically a cow at two years old and she should at that point not have to have extra supplement in order to breed back and, and fit into the herd. She should be shaped like a cow at that point. She shouldn't get up when she calves. But um, yeah, it's, a, it's a fine line to walk between, you know, you can't, I don't want to, I don't want to feed them corn, but if you've got some good hay that you can keep those heifers uh, from the time they're weaned, our heifers will gain, you know, we, we, we leave the heifers on the calves till they're nine or 10 months old. And then we just cross the fence with them and there's no stress on the calves, they go on. The mama's proud, proud to see them going at that time. Uh, but, uh, you know, calves go on. But at that point, those calves, they got to keep gaining weight. They have to, you know, I, I like for my heifers to be up around um, 600, 650 pounds by the time we turn bulls out this time of year when we cave in April. Second part to my yes, question, sir. which is a follow-on to what you said, I think, is our, we aim to uh, have the first calf out of a um, heifer at age two. And... One of the challenges that we have in our place in Northeast Texas is then to get them to breed back to calve next year. Um, I have considered the notion of some kind of a supplemental program because that first calf heifer is not only growing, she's also feeding her offspring. So how do you manage those? Well, uh, I firmly believe that if you get your cows two inches too high, you have that big problem as a two-year-old. If you get your... Uh, the frame two and three cattle and you frame two and three bulls that have got substance and early maturing, then early maturing is what we want. We want those heifers that are a cow at two years old. They're shaped like a cow. They don't get up when they have a calf. And you haven't got to give them that, that extra supplement. But if they're just a little bit too, if they're still in that, if, you, if you're long growth curve, if, you, if your cattle are still in that too long a growth ball, I call it, or too long a growth curve, if they're not maturing until three years old, if they're still trying to breed back and all that, then you you probably will have to supplement a little bit to them breed back. But the pride we ha we we supplement. We don't separate our two-year-olds. You separate your two-year-olds. You do. You give them extra supplementation. No, but we make sure they eat plenty of grass. Yeah, they get the ice cream they got, grass. They got well, all of them have to have plenty of grass. Yeah, they have all have, to have grass, but but yeah. Plenty but, of grass. Yeah, but anyway, uh, uh, to me, uh, we don't supplement those two years old and we we expect them to fit right in with the cows but i've been doing this for about 35 years and, and if they're too big they don't fit in my problem if they come if i have to do that to them i'll get rid of them because they're they're, they're not the right kind for what we need long term thank you sir uh, again i let me get let me give the thanks to the to the my my, my uh, lord and savior jesus christ for letting me even be here today and 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 
and in years and years to come, I want the credit to go to him. I didn't do this. He led me through it. I had times when I wanted to give up. And between him and my wife, they would say, please, give it, give it a few more months. See, see if some people will come on board. Amen. I was on an island by myself. I felt like trying to tell people that little cows were, need, we need to get our cow herd size down. We need to get away from these big cows to make money. And I felt like that for a long time, I felt like I was just on an island and everybody else was going the other way. But now then, to see this many people here at, uh, on a farm in Tennessee, it does my heart good. But I want each one of you to know that we want this to be the most real thing that you've ever done. I'm on the side of the new people getting in. Most breeds are on the side of the of the big high pyramid breeders. They want to sell you a ten thousand dollar animal, and then when it comes time for you to have a sale, it's probably worth two thousand. Let's, let's not let that happen in this breed. If you come and buy a cow from me and you take care of her and a year later something happens that you decide you don't want to have this cow anymore, I'll give you the same price you give me for that cow. If all of us as breeders would do that, if we will back up what we say, and in our breed we've been able to cut out the ring men, the auctioneers, and all the 25% expenses it comes to have a sale. We can put them up on the website and they're gone in a couple of weeks. If you, if you got cows to sell and you ain't got nobody to buy them, call Dave Roberts. We got people all call Dave every day saying, hey, we're gonna buy some South Poles. Even half bloods, three quarter bloods. If you're breeding them, we got we got people that are wanting to buy them and breed up. They're the best choice to have in the South. But we want to be real. We want, we don't want to ever feel like that that we're not the, the common commercial cattlemen that's trying to make a living and young people that are trying to get into the business. You're the ones that I want to influence. These old people, they they probably ain't going to, they're too far gone probably. <laughs> With you young folks, y'all still got a chance to lock on to what's happening, get the real world out there, and forget all the bullshit and the crap, and, and breed cows. Good, good cows that give you a calf every year, and harvest grass in the most efficient manner possible, and make a living at it. Make money at it. There's nothing wrong, Greg, 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 Judy, Greg Judy says, there's nothing wrong with making money in the cattle business. It's a rarity, but there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I love being here today. Um, I got another five minutes. I'll take some more questions. You have any cows to sell? I got any cows for sale? I always got cows for sale. I'm in. But, uh, yes, yeah, sir. We've got two or three, four thousand people on the South Pole. We've got probably three or 4,000 people on South Pole Forum. You look around here today and we've got at least 400 people. How do we convince everybody a mere $100 is the best investment they could ever make by joining the South Pole Association? Well, uh, I, I suggest we just hang everybody that don't want to join. <laughs> That's a pretty good idea. No, I think if, if for no other reason you have access at $10 a straw to the very best uh, bulls in the breed uh, to buy at, at, at uh, I call it dealer cost, wholesale price. But, uh, you know, and, and, we, and maybe we don't, maybe we're not for everybody. You know, I'm not trying to get everybody. I only want, I only want to get those people that are serious about making a living in the cattle business. Those guys that want to take their picture. That's why we don't have a show. You know, I went through the show deal with cattle over the years and I felt like that it never helped the breed showing an animal because it was pretty um you know taking a picture of it, getting your blue ribbon if, if it's an ego thing you want if you got the money to afford the ego trip go for it but if you're trying to make a living on cows show ring ain't it there's never you know the last 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 hereford bull that was national champion that done any good for the hereford breed was u81 back in 1961 i guess it was sort of back but since then, I mean, you can't, every bull that they come up with is a, he's not an online bred, they're a, they're a, they're a terminal bull, or 95% of them are. And, and next year, you never hear, you never see any dollars out of those bulls. Two years later, they're gone. But the purebred industry is built off of having rabbits to chase. You gotta have a rabbit. This one's longer, taller, wider, thicker, more marbling, more ribeye. Gotta be more something for them to sell them to you. 
But the South Pole, I want it to be the best average calf. I tell people when I go out to pick my bull calves every year, first thing I look at is the mother. Is, she, is her udder there? Is she going to hold together for 15, 20 years? Is she ideal phenotype to fit my environment, the right size, shape? If all that falls in and she has a good bull calf, then he's considered for my program. Then I start looking at his individual traits, his testicles, his sheath. Uh, is he? Uh, is he got, got a good? Uh, he's got good disposition. Um, but I try to pick, pick the bull that's the best average bull I've got. Does that make any sense? You know, no extremes anywhere. I, don't, I want the least faults I have, and the least extremes. If he's good everywhere, I can't find a fault in him. He's not the biggest. He's not the longest. He's not got the biggest testicles. He's not. He didn't make, but but he's the, the best average bull. He's got the least faults, and that's the bull that you'll make progress with. Anytime we try to chase extremes, it always comes back to bias. So when you go out there and you look with your, your cowboy eye, I say, that's okay to look. It's good fun to look. But don't breed you don't base your breeding decision off of your eyeball. You gotta observe, but the thing to observe is the history of that cow and cow family. Yes, sir. It's obviously important for the record people that you mentioned earlier. Do you have any sort of you have any sort of standardized record keeping system you use a software program or you just do it on Excel or do you have any particular way of doing it? <laughs> no, I'm talking about Bent Tree Farms. We, we, we keep uh, our individual records and try to turn in, we uh, believe in turning in all of our cows, 100% uh, total turn in to uh, performance on the cows where they're open, if they lost a calf. If we turn all this information in, then over a period of time, it's very simple to look at rec good records and, and identify the best seed stock that's in that guy's herd. Follow up on that, being a CPA, I guess, but the, uh, is the association considered trying to come up with a standardized? We are, we are looking at several different things. We're currently working on what's called a maternal index, which will uh, give a cow, cow credit for fertility and longevity she'll earn stars at each point in her career. In other words, if she's 10 years old and has got, has, has had eight calves, she may get a silver star. You know, but uh, they'll have to, we'll have to, we're trying to come up with that standard so that her number will change every year, her fertility index, I'll call it, or profit index. It would change every year depending on her calves and how they perform. If they're above average of, of, the, of the group, as far as fertility longevity, then her numbers will continue to raise. If we stack those cows in our pedigree, we can't help but make progress. Yes, sir. Having lived through the notion of being a cow calf producer and selling into the next step, because even though our calves qualify for anything one wants to call natural or raised on, on grass, the rest of us here really know that there's a cattle business and a beef business separated by the processors. I am looking for someone who could both finish my calves, retained ownership or not, but finish my calves, process them, and put them into the retail market. I know the most of the successful people here are sort of, I'm going to use the term face-to-face, uh, versus direct sales, and I understand the uh, philosophy about that. What guidance can you give me about uh, my question? My, gu my guidance is that the, in our breed, the females are the gold mine, and the steers are a byproduct of what we're doing. You want all you can get out of your steers, and we have programs coming. We have people that are doing uh, South Pole and, and natural meat programs. So if you hook up one of them and get a premium on your steers, that's great. But right now, our, our females, they're bringing what, two or three times what Cell barn heifers your brain, so that you, if that's that's your incentives. To, is to, and the gold mine is in, in maternal end is your females. And I still go back to the fact that steers are a byproduct. Don't try to base your profit and loss off of steers because uh, again, it's 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 a tough market, you know. But again, you want to get all you can out of your steers and just keep just keep uh, looking on the South Pole website. We'll try to get where we have some people on there that are that are they're looking for steers and 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 try to hook them up with people that are producing steers. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I, my time is about up. 
So uh, I like to end by by just saying that uh, again, it's uh, I'm humbled at, at the amount of folks that are interested in our breed right now. And we don't want you to do anything that you're not ready to do. If you have any questions, there are no silly, there are no stupid questions. If you got a question about something, ask me or some of the board members. I'll be around here all day. If you got, if you want an opinion on a cow or a bull or whatever, come and get me. I'll be happy to help you all I can. I'm trying to help you and you people getting in. And like I said before, this there's some good cows here today. I hope you take some of them home with you. Um, but use your, you know, educate yourself on what you're trying to do, and, and the closer you can get cattle to your environment, the better off they'll be. They'll be. Somebody asked me, well, said, so will these cattle work up in, in uh, Kentucky? So it gets cold up there. I said, well, uh, you know, we have cattle that are up further north than you in Pennsylvania and Minnesota and different places. We don't recommend you take South Pole and the slick haired animals here into that, that, those environments. If you're going to take South Pole, go out in the wintertime and find some cows that grow hair you know that, that, that will hire up and then as the longer they're on your place the more they will adapt to your environment but uh yes i'm not real familiar with cattles and straws um i'm assuming they're frozen seeds, correct yes sir is there a percentage of good or bad it does or doesn't stay with the frozen no uh it it uh, really depends on 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 the cows the ai technician and the quality of the semen i mean all that goes into you don't do chill with the cattle I've never, I've never done chill, but uh, I, somebody, maybe somebody here that does a lot of AI can answer that question more than me. But I, I guess that we'll get somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, uh, 60 or 70 percent conception on AI. As a guess. Thank you all again. Uh, if I can be of any help to anybody, I, uh, I, I love the, the cattle business. I love the family farm. Um, Let's, let's go forward together with this great breed and try to make it uh, the best that we could possibly make it. Thank you all very much. Thank you.